It was, of course, Jefferson's gift at one time or another to put with eloquence the right answer to every moral question. In practice, however, he seldom deviated from an opportunistic course calculated to bring him power. Gore Vidal. Uh, so for today's episode of Liberty versus Power with my good friend Patrick Newman, author of Cronyism, Liberty versus Power in America, seven, 1607 to 1849, we're going to look at the, the turn of the Jeffersonian Revolution, particularly focusing on the second term, the Louisiana Purchase and the consequences thereof. But Patrick, I want to start this episode by kind of going back a little bit and setting what I think is one of the aspects of early American history that we are obviously not talked you know, told in schools. Um, that you know, it's something that comes through in uh, the fifth volume of Conceived in Liberty. It comes through in your book that there really was a lot of interest in the establishment of governments outside of Washington D.C. In the Constitution, right? There, there were concerted efforts to break away from the regime that had been established, particularly after the Constitution, uh, and an and interest in kind of a, a politically decentralized sort of format. Um, you know, Jefferson himself had spoken in favor of such arrangements. Um, but I think this is something that, you know, when we think about this period of time and, and we think about the consequences of the Louisiana Purchase, it's important to kind of keep that in the back of our mind when we think about, again, there are a lot of Americans or, or at least a lot of residents of these territories that, you know, were, were perfectly fine thinking outside the box in the way that uh, political arrangement should be had. Yeah, so that's a, that's a great point. Basically, I, one thing I argue in my book is that I think the Louisiana Purchase was in many ways a, a turning point for the United States. It was enormously important in a history of cronyism. Not a lot of people uh, realize that because a lot of people don't know how much cronyism was connected with Western expansion and the actual expansion of the country. When we're uh, taught history in uh, high school, et cetera, we're, we're usually taught that there's – it was, it was almost ordained, you know, ordained that we were going to expand to the West Coast. The United States would include you know, everything in the modern continental United States, as well as then Alaska and Hawaii. But it wasn't always so. A lot of people thought that there would be multiple confederacies. There could be Western governments. A lot of people thought the West Coast would be a separate republic. This even continued into, the, in, into potentially into the Civil War when people thought California was going to secede. That's partially why we built the Transcontinental Railroad uh, to, to bring them in. And this is it, 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 it's, it's, it's crucial to recognize this because it's crucial to remember and to realize that it's very hard to have a limited government over a large territory. Okay, small governments, uh, you know, a small government in terms of political economy is generally only possible under, uh, you know, a small t uh, territorial region. All right. So we can pretty much sum up and describe uh, everything from the, the Revolutionary War uh, through the Louisiana Purchase and so on using Jefferson's phrase, the empire of liberty. Okay, this is the title of a uh, Gordon Wood book. And Jefferson uh, used this to describe his vision for what the North American continent would look like. Okay, Jefferson thought you would have, um, at the very least, a very states' rights oriented uh, single government, or more likely, you would have multiple confederacies uh, throughout the continent that would be united through a common language, English, as well as constitutional norms. Okay, and this is something that's really important. This is a true um, ethos uh, of, of, of your average American back then that totally gets overlooked because it's just seen as, well, you need centralization and you need one government. But it wasn't always so. Well, there's also some some personal ambition at play here. Um, you know, one of the figures that is brought up in Conceived in Liberty Five is a very fascinating character, a, a James Wilkinson, uh, who you know saw himself. And, and when we're talking about the West in particular during these days, I mean, we're not we're not necessarily talking about the Pacific Ocean, though, though that definitely comes into play. But but you know, we're, we're thinking just you know west of the Appalachians, right? You know, Kentucky was the far west frontier. Um, and, and yet you did have an attempt, particularly the economic impact of, of that Mississippi River, right? You know, one of the, the major early uh, 
points of, of you know, foreign relations, right, was getting access to the Mississippi River. Um, and, and there's very interesting sort of background there with, with good old John Jay uh, uh, trying to get an agreement for kind of you know, broad usage of that for the Americans and, and some division there. But if, if the American government can't get access to that Mississippi River, uh, Mr. Wilkinson and some other others in the West kind of recognize, okay, well, if, if Spain has access to what we need and the American government doesn't, uh, then, then really what is in our best interest? Is it to ally with the ones with the river or those without? I, I, it's, it's just some, some interesting overlooked little anecdotes here. Uh, can you touch on a little bit about uh, uh, Mr. Wilkinson? Yeah, I, of, of course. So this is something that uh, when I read editing Rothbard's Conceived in Liberty, you know, that fifth volume, I was absolutely delighted and fascinated by because you don't hear about this. You don't hear about how uh, Kentucky tried to go at it, le led by James Wilkinson to be its own state. You know, you, you I've never heard I never heard of the proposed independent state of Franklin like an additional state basically made out of, of, of some of the, uh, the, 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 uh, the land in that area. Um, so the, the Mississippi river was, was very important in terms of controlling trade at this time period due to the Appalachian mountains. If you were, uh, really the, the, you know, if you were in the West, so at the West, even something like Western Pennsylvania or Ohio, et cetera, you would, you were closer in terms of, uh, you know, closer economically to the Mississippi river than you were with the East coast. So rather than ship your goods East to West, you would actually ship your goods North to South through the port of New Orleans and then, sh and then have it be carried up to the East coast, uh, by, by, boats, et cetera. So it was very important uh, to have control of this Mississippi River. Now, Britain in the Treaty of France, uh, excuse me, at the Treaty of France and the Treaty of Paris after the Revolutionary War had kind of uh, given the United States the, 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 the rights to use the Mississippi River, even though like they didn't really have control of it. This is a little bit, a little bit of power politics going on by Britain trying to sort of play off potential enemy potential enemies uh you know against each other and um you, during this time period uh, there was a lot of southerners and westerners who wanted to use the Mississippi River and Spain wouldn't let them and the proposed Jay Gardoki treaty uh with uh, with uh, John Jay and uh, the um, uh, Gardoki from 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 Spain was basically going to relinquish the Americans use of the Mississippi River and Spain was generally prepared to enter into you know various other uh, favorable arrangements to uh, the United States and southerners and westerners Westerners were very upset about this. Patrick Henry, who is a governor of Virginia, was very upset about this. And this would have been a major catalyst to potentially having multiple confederacies because the South really wanted to use the Mississippi River, as did the West. And if the United States would not get control of the Mississippi River, then the country would uh, would 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 fracture. At least the land in that country would fracture. And this was seen uh, in movements with, with with James Wilkinson, who wanted to sort of work with Spain and not work the United States. So he was pushing for an independent state of Kentucky. Uh, unfortunately for him, as well as really from you and I, our, our perspective, Kentucky only just entered in as a state into the union. Union, not as its own state. But this Mississippi River thing, I cannot stress this enough, how important this was really for uni un the United States economy up until really the, the, the Civil War with the rise of railroads. So whoever controlled the Mississippi River controlled uh, a lot of Western commerce as well as the Gulf. And so the United States wanted to have a stronger government that would allow him to take the Mississippi River. And, and this is still an issue going again right up to the Louisiana Purchase. While the, the James Wilkinson initial sort of, of you know, plot uh, was, what I believe, 1780s, right? Um, later on, yeah. however, Mr. Wilkinson is once again part of a plot by uh, former Vice President Aaron Burr to try to rally up old American troops and organize military action against Spanish-controlled New Orleans uh, 
with the explicit goal of creating, you know, a, a new government there with Aaron Burr at the head. And, and he brings in, you know, he, he talks to Andrew Jackson about it and William Henry Harrison, lots of interesting characters. Um, and it's actually Wilkinson who, at this point, I think Wilkinson was on the payroll of the Spanish uh, uh, Native American tribes, the, the British, the American government, Burr's group. I mean, it's just you know, fascinating. Uh, uh, he, he, was, he was definitely a, 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 you know, billing maximally. Um, but, you know, it, it's really still up to this point where there is still a lot of, of you know, movement along these lines. And, and that kind of sets the stage for when we get this environment where, you know, the, the, the Louisiana Purchase comes to be. One of the other things I think is interesting is the historical framework we're, that we're building off of here. We're, we're thinking about, you know, Napoleon is at, you know, the, is, is, is kind of at, at his peak within France, right? There, there is a lot of stuff that's happening in the global environment that is also playing a role here in setting up, uh, you know, the, the Louisiana Purchase. Because, and originally, you know, the, the Louisiana Purchase was not, you know, it, it pushed by the Jefferson administration, but rather, uh, as, as you outlined in the book, uh, you know, part of, you know, initial diplomatic talks, uh, you know, more broadly. Can, can you just talk about kind of the, the framework that gets us into the actual conversations of the purchase itself? Yeah, sure. So just to sort of speed through the American history, which we've been covering in prior episodes, obviously the U.S. Constitution gets passed. And then in 1795, I believe there was Pickney's Treaty, which basically allowed the United States to trade on the Mississippi River. This was done with a little bit of coercion in the sense that Spain was now fearful of after Jay's Treaty of an alliance between Britain and the United States. So this is sort of, well, we're able to one you, you know, once, once again, sort of use our might to threaten to get what we want. And of course, this, uh, I, be I believe it was Robert Morris who noted that this would uh, increase the land values in that area of which he held. So there you go. You got all of the crony interest there. And by 1800, so around when, when, when Jefferson uh, became president in 1801, there was a lot of sort of a uh, worldwide politics going on that, you know, it, it tangentially would affect the United States. Most notably, Spain uh, had sort of secretly agreed to transfer its control of Louisiana to France. OK, now a couple of things. Louisiana back then did not just refer to the state of Louisiana, which we have now. OK, New Orleans was the most important part of that. All right. Obviously, it's a port city. It's at the it's at the end of the Mississippi River. It's right on the Gulf. But L Louisiana, the land stretched all the way up to uh, basically Montana. So you can look at a map online and you can just see how large this uh, area was. And so transferring it from Spain uh, to France was obviously a major power play because the Spanish government was seen now as very decrepit. It was sort of holding on to a crumbling empire and it had acquired, uh, you know, in, in many, uh, you know, hundreds of years ago, et cetera. Louisiana itself had bounced around in control. And Spain says they're going to transfer it to France, provided that France helps them install some Spanish royalty uh, in, into a, a various government in Europe. And France agrees never to transfer to Great Britain or the United States. OK, so unfortunately for Spain, uh, France basically said no. We're, we're, we're not going to do that. The United States was worried when France had control of Louisiana because they said, all right, here is now a different animal than what we've dealt with with Spain. You've got Napoleon. He is currently, you know, riding high in Europe. Then there's a string of successes uh, in the early 1800s. So clearly he had potential. But very quickly on Napoleon realized that it just wasn't feasible to have a French presence in North America, uh, colonies, et cetera, especially when he had to deal with war in Europe and Great Britain. OK, so this Louisiana issue featured prominently in the uh, United States politics at the time. Jefferson had initially wanted to just purchase uh, New Orleans or at least get control of the Mississippi River, but then the entire land soon became available to him. And this was an enormous temptation. Yeah, they made a deal too good to, to pass up. Um, re re remind me of the details of, of the deal itself. $15 million for a whole bunch of land? 
Yeah, it was fifteen million dollars, and so for our for our modern readers, it, it, it fifteen million dollars. You're like, well, well, that's nothing now. You know, government spend trillions, and even back then, actually, so even adjusted for inflation, it was it was a bargain for the land. It it really was when you just think of the massive amount. Napoleon wanted money, and he wanted it fast because he wanted to start a new war. So he needed some quick cash. And so this is something that is usually kind of sold as a an obvious good move, right? They, they're I think the typical high school textbook may even mention a little bit of uh, constitutional concerns at the time that ultimately this was just too much, you know, such a good steal. You could not pass it up. But I, I think it's interesting from this perspective, and I really think this chapter is one of the, the, the very best in really highlighting the difference of the narrative uh, that, that you have outlined here, building off of Rothbard's work, because it, it's, it's the, the the impact of this absolutely corrupting the political ideals of what we think about with Jeffersonian politics, right? And I, I love the way that you start off this chapter, uh, framing it with the death of Hamilton, uh, how how his death in 1804 uh, was the hammer uh, hammered the nail into the Federalist coffin. But while the reactionary forces decayed, their special interest policies lived on. For slowly but surely, the libertarian Republicans embraced statism, and so that it, it is this move. Because of you know, touching on the aspects that we were talking about last week with kind of the recognition that with the drawing back of the, the spending programs of the Federalist regime and things like that, it's not only important just in a tax aspect, right? Like, oh, well, you know, this is going to create more burdensome taxes on farmers and things like that. But th th there really is a corrupting element here when you think about the creation of, of new government offices, when you think about money spent and in investments uh, that you know have to be allocated through the political process. You start dealing with a, a, a sectional differences and different considerations in here. You know, the, the, the growth of this again, major increase of spending done through questionable constitutional grounds, though, from the perspective of you know, the way that we, that we understand the, the reason for the Constitution, it was explicitly designed to expand the government, not to limit it, and therefore it it can be very fairly argued, as was at the time, that this was a constitutional move, even if it went against the Jeffersonian principles and that the strictly the, the strict reading of the Constitution that the old Republicans that that we've been praising, you know, that, that that strategic pivot, you know. There, there is a, a sound legal argument in defense of the Constitution, but it goes against that work being done by, again, in, nom in theory, the political party in power right now. Yeah, so this this is a very important point to understand regarding the Louisiana Purchase and just what exactly it did to the Republican Party. Because in many ways, it's sort of this – it was uh, the, the, this, this corrupting agent because it, it, it swelled the amount of land in the country to an, a, an enormous size. And this led to all sorts of changes in the Republican Party, which, which we will – uh, which we will get to, but it was this, the, this usually when the Louisiana purchase is discussed in high school, uh, uh, you know, American history textbooks or even college American history textbooks, it's described as one of the most important and beneficial, uh, per, you know, laws in United States history. And it's generally regarded as Jefferson's best legislation. So that's when people who usually are Jefferson haters, they'll say, well, he did that. He did the Louisiana Purchase, which, of course, from our perspective, is probably like his worst thing that he did, right? Because um, by pushing for this, it really did open up Pandora's box, so to speak, to broad constructionism, all right? The Constitution does intended by, you know, is, is intended by the Federalists, it does allow for the purchase and annexation and incorporation of territories into the United States. They, they, they intended this. Okay. And many Republicans also argued along these lines, but Jefferson was dedicated during this time period to upholding his strict constructionist view. And his logic was basically saying, okay, we can read into the treaty making power because of course there has to be a treaty in order to purchase the, uh, the, the, the land, you know, from, from another country, but it's saying, well, once we do that, well then, you know, the powers are boundless. So wouldn't it be better to just pass an amendment Okay, requiring uh, or like pass an amendment allowing or in explicitly enabling us to do that 
then we can purchase the territory. And for this, it's it's really the precedent. So it's the idea that's saying, all right, we're in control of the government. We could read the Constitution broadly, or we could stick by our principles, uh, read the Constitution strictly, and then we're going to set a good precedent. Because even this way, it would still be a problem if Louisiana was purchased, but it would have been less a problem because at least there would have been an amendment. Okay, but Jefferson ultimately um, said uh, he, he discarded this uh, this possibility. He said, "All right, we'll pass an amendment after the fact, which is completely useless. Then it defeats the purpose of actually having a binding constitution." And once he did that, once he he sort of broke his rule, once he stuck his hand into the cookie jar, so to speak. Well, then he really just said, "All right, well, why don't we use the constitution? Uh, you know, read it broadly to accomplish other aims." that we want. And then when that happened, the whole strict constructionist approach really suffered a, a fatal setback. So this Louisiana purchase has important implications, not just for territorial land, you know, la land mass and all of that, but also for the, um, the, 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 the constitutional implications regarding other policy. So it's really important to understand that Jefferson, he, he was really torn by this and he was at one point going to push for an amendment and even though some people said Napoleon wasn't going to wait, uh, Napoleon was going to wait. He needed the money. Uh, he wasn't going to, uh, he, he, he was only going to sell it to the United States. So there, there wasn't someone else. Uh, he needed the money and it could have, it could have gone through, but instead Jefferson just basically decided to downplay constitutional issues. And once he did that, the die was cast, so to speak. And I think that's what makes the, the Jeffersonian, uh, you know, tenure, if, if it was anybody besides Jefferson sort of in that role, even if the same decisions were made, you know, once you have, you know, like literally the, the, the living philosopher, you know, the, the embodiment of, you know, values, they could, you can only you know, you describe it inherently as Jeffersonian. When you have him as the head of state during this time, I think it also kind of shows the obvious limitations. You know, you, you still have people out there that believe, oh, well, if only you have a constitutional framework that we stick really close to. You know, if Jefferson can't do it, then then who is, right? You know, the, the idea that legal presidents and, and very strict interpretations of governing documents, that that alone can you know stand against power, can, can defend liberty against power. Uh, I, I, can't, I think this is a very important illustration of how that doesn't work. And that, that ultimately it's, it's, it's only by having people in that position that can say no, you know, that, that, that can say no to that deal, um, that, that can stop it from happening. And I, I think it's interesting the way you lay out, because not only do we have the consequences just from a, a political president sort of standpoint, but there's also the personal relationships here, right? Because it, it wasn't simply Thomas Jefferson that ended up kind of going along with the convenient out here, but there are several old Republicans the people that have been championing this very strict constitutionalist framework, uh, you know, borrowing from, you know, trying, trying to keep that anti-federalist sort of project, if you will, alive. A lot of them kind of went on board with this. You mentioned John T Taylor of Virginia, how, how, how uh, 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 John Randolph uh, is a defender of the constitutionality as, as a loyal Jeffersonian, but that this kind of ends up being a breaking point here. Can I talk a little bit about the, the, the personal relationships that are altered by this move within this kind of old republic tradition. Yeah. Okay. So this is this is a very important um, aspect of the uh, aspect of the Louisiana Purchase that um, really kind of it doesn't get looked at because looking into the personal relationships and the unique uh, bonds various individuals had is, is is sort of overlooked in American history, particularly around this time. So there's a couple of things that need to be mentioned. One, um, the Republican Party, uh, many of the leaders had sort of decided to downplay the constitutionality issue. This is notably John Taylor, who was briefly a senator during this time, as well as Congressman John Randolph. They did recognize that the constitutionality issue was an issue. OK, so it was actually a problem. And this was it was it was brought up for basically two reasons that's important to distinguish between this. One, you genuinely had Republicans who were a little concerned at this. They recognized that, hey, is this 
uh, constitutional. And also on the related note, does France actually have the right to sell us this land? That was a big uh, sticking point in terms of proof of ownership, so to speak. The constitutionality issue was also brought up by uh, federalists who were very upset at this. They were the uh, minority party ever since the revolution of 1800. And they realized that adding Louisiana to the United States would basically relegate New England to a perpetual minority because all of these states in the West, they would be loyal to the Republican Party. They would basically be able to outvote the Federalists. So the Federalists wanted to use any tactic they could, and they brought up the constitutionality issue, not as an actual sort of ideological motivation, but simply just to try and throw a, a roadblock in. So this is important because this is implications as well for, for later history. There are many who use the constitutionality issue simply as an obstructionist tactic. Okay, James Madison had kind of did that earlier. He was this big government guy. Then he became the small government guy. And, you know, that was sort of an opportunistic switch. But Randolph, uh, Taylor, Jefferson, they were all ideologically in favor of strict constructionism. But this time they just sort of decided to sweep it under the rug to get what they wanted, which was Louisiana. And because uh, Randolph was a distant cousin of Jefferson, he was close with Jefferson. He was kind of Jefferson's man in Congress. This was, uh, you know, the, the, this, this, this was an important moment, uh, especially because Randolph most famously became a critic of the uh, Louisiana Purchase. So this constitutionality issue was brought up, but it was ultimately sidestepped simply because the, uh, the Jefferson and the Republican Party, they wanted all of that land. And it was just at the end of the day, it was just too much land. The land corrupted the Republican Party. Yeah. And it's interesting is that there's a counter argument that was being made in, in some pockets of time that basically they, they, they too wanted the land but thought ultimately kind of buying it was unnecessary because of the, the thought that, no, there's some military adventurism that you can have down here. You know, you get together a few militia groups and uh, with the promise of being, you know, them being able to be become very wealthy men uh, by, by taking over some of these areas. Like there, there was a counter argument as well that you, know, you didn't need government to do it, that the, the, the farmers and the, the hunters out there could kind of take care of the, the Spanish on their own right. Uh, uh, getting together, which again, I, I just think is an interesting dynamic here. Um, but uh, if, if I recall correctly, uh, John Randolph goes on to say that that this moment, this this decision with the Louisiana Purchase, is the greatest curse that ever befell us. Right? Infamously, he said that. So, regarding your your earlier point, uh, yeah, that this is what the Federalists wanted to do when Spain closed off use of the river because Americans were being disrespectful to Spain. At least, not really closing off use of the river, basically just requiring them uh, some extra payments. Federalists, including Hamilton, said, "Well, we just got to invade, then negotiate." And Republicans, even especially the Western ones, they didn't want war, so they fortunately said, no, we're not going to do this. And then the news of the sale from France came and changed everything and all that good stuff. But so Randolph, after the fact, after the Louisiana Purchase is passed in late 1803, Randolph uh, in the second Jefferson administration and beyond started to realize that this was actually not as good of a um, uh, of, of a purchase as he thought it was. And this was because one, um, it was leading to more and more desires for land, right? Because once you have some uh, land, then you need to expand more in order to protect the new frontier. Of course, then when you get the new frontier, then you need more land to protect, you know, the frontier and then so on and so forth. And that also this massive expansion in order to keep it in the United States, to keep it from breaking apart, it's leading a lot of politicians to embrace government funded public work. So internal improvements, roads, canals, et cetera, binding the extremities of this enlarged empire together. Okay. And it also, uh, it was increase the power of the executive's influence in the legislative process, which Randolph didn't like. So he became sort of anti-Louisiana purchase because he realized that sort of 
what just what a uh, a tripwire this whole thing was and this was all tied in with him breaking with Jefferson on a number of Jefferson's expansionist policies that he pursued in his second administration after the Louisiana purchase because he was corrupted by it so the the land led to corruption and the corruption led to cronyism well, uh, this guy gets to, uh, you know, one of the great libertarian memes of, of you know, who will build the roads. This kind of goes directly to, you know, this being a very, very important issue, actually, because, you know, as, as you outline, well, I, I think one of the things that I really enjoy is you're highlighting the degree to which, you know, a lot of the arguments for pumping money into the, these internal improvements was on the importance of building up you know, the, the, the perception that state investment, that private investment in roads, canals, and all the things needed for internal trade would, would not be up to what was necessary uh, to, to, to kind of get the economy go- going. But as you point out, you know, the, the economy of America was greatly influenced by what was going on in Europe and the degree to which that attracted capital to the shipping industry and, and New England interests, I think, in particular – taking advantage of the trade embargoes going on with Europe. You know, there, there was marketplaces for these goods paying very, very good money because of the disruptions in, you know, uh, Atlantic trade, European trade, that you know, some of the arguments being made in favor of in the spending aspect that came after the purchase itself, you know, the, the economic analysis is, is not as complete uh, as as you know, if we look a, a much broader scale at what's going on globally. Yeah, so this is this is a great point, and this is especially an issue in traditional American history because they say, well, you you have to have the government build roads, you have to have the government build infrastructure. So, well, even if you had potential problems, well, this is just the only way it could be. We even see this today, you know, with the infrastructure bill, uh, whatever. Just assume that well, the government has to be in charge of infrastructure, and that's just simply not true. One, uh, there was private uh, roads and, in, in, you know, with some government assistance on the state and local level, but it was generally minor. Uh, roads were built to connect towns. Uh, merchants would pay for the construction of the roads, even though they might not get a direct return on the road, but they would get the indirect return through more commerce coming into the town, boosting their sales and so on. So you did have private enterprise uh, produce what, what are traditionally thought of as public goods, and that these privatized roads, canals, railroads later on, et cetera, inexorably were much more efficient than the government enterprises. Okay. And I did love, I loved it when I found that explanation. I think it was by this engineer, Benjamin Latrobe. And he brings this up and I said, oh, this is such a genius explanation that, well, one of the reasons why uh, there was a relative lack of funds for private infrastructure during this time period was not due to the fault of the free market. It's just that so much private investment was going into the shipping industry because it was very profitable for Americans to kind of play both sides and to engage in smuggling and to ship goods to uh, nations at war with each other and that this was a diversion this is a government diversion of funds this wasn't uh you know entirely done by the private sector so in the absence of the napoleonic wars if we just pretended for some reason that they never happened you would have seen much more uh private investment in infrastructure even more than what already occurred so it's it's important to note this in uh just to see because it's such a one it's such a fascinating explanation but it also shows that yeah the free market can do things Things. You don't need the government uh, to, to funnel money into various taxpayer boondoggles, et cetera. And of course, unfortunately, one of the big champions of this entire process of really pumping money into canals and roads and other internal improvements is our boy Albert Gallatin, um, who, who actually creates, you know, he has this entire system that he proposes. Um, one of the things I, I think is interesting is, again, if we, if we think about the way that something as, you know, or you know, mundane as road construction really does play into uh, the, 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 the corruption, the corrupting aspect. Is you highlight the example of the national road um, that was plagued with delays, and you know they, they make decisions that ha- or are overly expensive because of the federal money involved. It, it ends up becoming something that is little used. 
um, the way that, uh, you know, we, we saw this particularly with the, the boom of the railroad industry, right? The, the way that certain routes go are purely political in nature. And, and then it also just adds new cards to the deck for, for wheeling and dealing. You know, I, I think Senator Clay, you, you highlight, kind of starts recognizing that, hey, if I want to bring money to Kentucky to get this road done here where I'm at, then what I need to do is start working with other states. So, you know, pat their back for spending and, and, and then we can, we can all benefit, right? And so it, it really creates this environment. With, with the other side of it is going, kind of going back to the, the point about the, the Republican Party really embracing the, this, this almost, you know, imperialistic aspect of you know, using the funds from the internal improvement side to make sure that federalist-dominated New England states don't get any ideas about separating, um, you know, which comes up from time to time Right, you know, secession and these sort of things were not simply a, a Western frontier thing. They were not a Southern thing. They were discussed in the North. It turns out they find that that you know, getting funding for internal improvements is a good way of of downplaying some of the radicals among them uh, and making sure that uh, you know there there is no state out there getting too many uh, questions about self determination in their own right. <laughs> yeah, when it comes to internal improvements, there's a tremendous amount of cronyism that's that's involved. I was always influenced. One of the first books I ever read was the myth of the robber barons by Burton Folsom. And when he goes into how the government transcontinental railroads, Union Pacific and Central Pacific in particular, were built, they were built uh, very poorly. They used the wrong materials. It was hastily done. There were these winding routes because they were trying to collect more money, et cetera, as opposed to James Hill's private Nor Great Northern. I was always very influenced by this argument, and I really try to show this in my own book, Cronyism, because, yeah, these, these, these constraints do affect government projects. Right. So the national road was you it was built with costly materials. There were political appointees of people in charge of creating the road that shouldn't really have been in charge of this. But they were there because it was a patronage job. Uh, there were political considerations for the route of the road. And uh, Gallatin basically told Jefferson that, hey, you know, the road should go through uh, various towns because we need them for an election. I think in one case, one of them was Gall it was also Gallatin's hometown. So, you know, a, a little bit of, a little bit of cronies and personal, personal sweetener there. And, uh, yeah, th this is, this is a huge issue because you see it throughout government, uh, investment, so-called investments that this is, uh, the, the inevitable result. So, and, you know, we, we really pushed for uh, the, 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 the keep New England in the union. We had the land speculation schemes of, of, of the Yazoo. We were trying to satisfy them or Jefferson is trying to placate them uh, that way. The, the internal improvements is really to keep the West from from leaving. Right. And this is always the idea that you got to give them a sweetener. Right. If they're supposed to stay in the union. And this is this is this is a big issue. One other point I just want to mention, uh, when we talk about various people, free market people, otherwise coming out in favor of internal improvements, uh, it is important to note that many laissez-faire economists at this time had also made, un unfortunately, in our opinion, they made exceptions saying that, oh, well, under certain conditions, uh, the government can build roads like Adam Smith or other people, whether it's military necessity, like for national defense or just something else, et cetera. In Americans, they accentuated that. They, 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 they thought, one, well, we can spend more money if we have all these fiscal surpluses uh, and if we want to keep the West in the Union or if it's underdeveloped, et cetera. But it ultimately came from um, the some of the, the the free market economists, the economic thought at this time, not really fully recognizing uh, the errors in their own logic. Ideas do have consequences in the policy realm. All right. And it's just important to uh, to, to note this. I, I remember reading one time Charles Sumner, a noted free trade, a noted free market Republican and the later Republican Party uh, actually had read John Baptiste say a treatise on uh, political economy. And he had uh, underlined the parts where say uh, had come out in favor of internal improvements. Right. <laughs> and so it's like it's an interesting uh, dynamic. So it's just important. Uh, to keep that in mind, Jefferson was anti-internal improvement. He recognized the corruption that it would cause, the political issues. He was familiar with free market thought. But once again, he acquiesced, uh, particularly when he realized that uh, 
he had to keep, you know, he had all this land in Louisiana. They better start building uh, public works to connect the West with the East. Well, you mentioned that the next topic I wanted to go over because it wasn't simply the Louisiana purchase, the internal improvements within there that became a, a dark spot of this time frame, but also, again, some of the, the ramifications of the Yazoo scandal um, that uh, we mentioned briefly in the last episode. And, and, and really, you know, it kind of starts off with, with, with actively bailing out land speculators here. And uh, so we kind of start setting the framework of privatized gains, socialized losses, um, can you just t touch on this role? Um, we're we're going to get to John Marshall here in, in, in a second, but kind of just setting up the, the dynamic of kind of the, the, the big business of, of land speculation and, and the way that this kind of you know, really in, is, is, is an is a illustration of legal privileges going directly to, to, to benefit a you know, financial corporate class. Yeah, exactly. So land speculation is, it was an enormously important um, aspect of cronyism in the past in ways that it's not now, simply because most land has been appropriated and, and somehow, you know, things have been built on it. But so back in the day, and this is something Rothbard mentions conceived in liberty, this comes from ethics of liberty, his natural rights, political philosophy, that for something to be truly owned, it has to be homesteaded. You have to mix your labor with it. Uh, so you have to build a, a fence on a plot of land. You have to cut down trees. You put a farm, whatever. So the gradual process of, excuse me, the, the, the process of settlement into the West would have been much more gradual if it was through this means, right? But instead, what you can do is the government can simply just declare ownership of land, saying, well, all of that land uh, is ours, and we're going to defend it with 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 military um, you know, arms and all of that. And then they can just sell those claims to speculators, who in turn can sell them to settlers, in many cases, people who've already lived on the land and say, oh, yeah, now you got to pay for this because we technically own the land, you don't. It's a huge instance of cronyism. So in the 1790s, Georgia uh, had basically sold all of this land to various speculators. And this was the land of Alabama and Mississippi, sort of the, the so-called Yazoo lands. And then it, the, the Georgia legislature wanted to revoke it. And Hamilton and the Federalists say, no, you can't do that because of the contract clause. And this sort of had remained unresolved when Jefferson became president. So Jefferson ultimately had wanted to compromise with the land speculators because, because many of them were from New England. And after the Louisiana Purchase, many uh, people in New England were now sort of the elites were kind of rumbling uh, threats of, 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 of secession or just something because they realized they would lose all of their political power from Louisiana. So Jefferson wants to set aside some land of, uh, you know, as sort of his compensation for the speculators. And this was something that really angered John Randolph because he's saying, wait a second, this is very clearly like the Federalists, uh, what the Federalists were doing in the 1790s. Uh, do we really want to go down this road? And Randolph was, in a, you know, he was, he was, he was a big, uh, fighter of this, and he kept on delaying it until until the matter went to the Supreme Court. But this itself, just this uh, Jefferson's moderation regarding the Yazoo uh, land issue, is 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 a big turning point because now he's actually sort of pursuing his own cronyism by saying, "No, we need to bail out these Yazoo uh, land claimants. We need to set aside some land and, and or some money, and we need to do this because we have to keep our country from breaking apart." Um, you know, when it comes to Supreme Court on this issue, one of the things I love is you highlighting the, uh, the questionable relationships of, of some of the, the Supreme Court justices to this entire racket of land speculation. Uh, can, can you please uh, touch on the, the great uh, John Marshall on this issue and, and, and why this might not have been completely uh, uh, on the up and up necessarily? Yeah. Yeah, so John Marshall is one of those uh, great, great instances of cronyism because a lot of people you learn about John Marshall. I, 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 I took AP US history when I was in high school. Uh, I've read a lot of history books. Um, I've read a lot of stuff on John Marshall and his constitutional opinions, and you got all these people. Uh, the the great, great man of the court. The, the great John Marshall. He's the big yeah. government advocate. What? None of these, you don't learn this at all. And I just find this simply astonishing. Uh, border, bordering scandalous is two things. One, that John Marshall and his brother James were enormous land speculators. 
right? So you're dealing with someone who's like, who is who has dealt with immense amount of land speculation, including in Virginia, and that these guys are also linked with who was at the time in the 1790s the the the, the one of the, the wealthiest, richest men in America, Robert Morris, James Marshall, John Marshall's uh, uh, brother, had married the daughter of Robert Mar uh, Morris, and they had engaged in various speculation uh, schemes together. So when you read this, you're like, whoa, 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 wait a second, why was I not informed of this at all? Like this might in influence uh, some people's opinions of this man. And John Marshall was someone who was very concerned about what would happen in the Yazoo, uh, you know, what would happen with the with the, the Yazoo claimants. Because John Marshall was in, in, un, undergoing, he, he was suffering a, a similar experience in Virginia. There was a large land grant in Virginia that now that the, the Virginia legislature had wanted to rescind. The Marshalls were involved in it. They didn't want that to happen. So the case of Fletcher v. Peck, all right, which is a Supreme Court case. This is John Marshall recalling what we spoke about in an earlier podcast regarding judicial review used to protect Federalist cronyism. John Marshall is using judicial review to overturn a state law, Georgia, basically rescinding the Yazoo uh, uh, land grants and saying, nope, can't do that. Uh, you, you know, you, you, you got to provide compensation for them. And OK, so why did he want to do that? All right. Obviously, John Marshall was a big government person. Ideologically, he wanted to find some uh, defense of this using the contract clause and all of that. But he also clearly wanted to protect his own land speculation. So he wanted to set a, uh, a, a precedent uh, for this. And you saw this in later Supreme Court cases um, uh, where, where basically uh, the, Mar the the Supreme Court upheld the validity of the um, uh, Marshall's titles to land in Virginia. Now, to be fair, Marshall had excused himself from these various uh, court cases, but Joseph Story, who was also on the Supreme Court, he was someone who had also worked for land speculators. He had also worked for the Yazoo land speculators. He's basically doing Marshall's dirty work on the Supreme Court. So this it's it's a fascinating story. It's it's one of the uh, it's similar to the George Washington, you know, uh, moving the capital to benefit himself. This is just like a, a very simple, uh, you know, tight explanation of just personal cronyism. And and what makes it all the more remarkable is this is this is a chief justice. <laughs> this is supposed to be a person who's who's above all this. He's he's a great you know, a uh, uh, legal analyst, and he's, he's kind of making deals basically to line his own pockets. And you're going, well, it's good to know nothing's changed in United States history. <laughs> well, speaking of figures that don't mind lining their own pocket, uh, uh, the next topic, let, let's go a little bit into the the fun of uh, the, the, the adventure, adventures of West and East Florida. Um, which once again pulls back in a diplomatic issue. Once again, it brings us back to this expansionist impulse that the Jeffersonians have taken on. And it also brings into the story uh, one of my favorite figures, uh, Minister Talleyrand of France, very flamboyant, uh, an interesting character in his own right. Um, you know, there, There is issues with, so, so, so when we think about you know, West Florida in particular, we can't let the name fool us. West Florida is, you know, Louisiana, Mississippi, right? As well, some of, uh, some of so that. So West Florida at the time, so you have to imagine, okay, so um, Florida, for, for those of you who, one of the things I really wanted to do in my book is to put pictures, which probably would have helped because there's like a lot of ge ge geography stuff. So at the time, Florida, the panhandle of Florida, right? So those those stomping grounds, the panhandle of Florida extended all the way to New Orleans. So the little juts in the states of Mississippi and Alabama, the modern states to the coast, those did not exist. And the panhandle of Florida, because of New Orleans, was the most important part of Florida. When people spoke about a Florida, when people spoke about Florida, they generally spoke about the panhandle because that was New Orleans. That was the Gulf. Really... It, East Florida, which is what we think of as Florida now, right? So everything from uh, modern day Jacksonville to Miami to Tampa, the peninsula was almost seen as sort of unimportant. You basically throw a couple military forts there so you can police the Gulf trade and all of that, keep other people there. But, you know, you that that was the, the real meat was in uh, West Florida. 
Okay. So Jefferson and the Republicans had sort of part of, in terms of the, the cronyism and the, the corruption, they had always insisted that uh, Florida was part of Louisiana, right? There's like, oh, well, France, you also sold us Florida. And France was like, uh, no, because Spain said, no, that's not part of Florida. It's, it's, it's not uh, there at all. Uh, it's, 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 it's a separate entity. And so then Jefferson basically decides to maneuver to, uh, acquire West Florida. Okay. So the land, uh, right by new Orleans. Okay. And so on. And what well, basically, um, uh, the, 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 the strategy that he uses, and this is something that infuriated Randolph was basically, he wanted to bribe France to coerce Spain into giving up Florida. OK, and this is where Talleyrand was involved is basically saying like, yeah, give us a little sweetener and, you know, we'll get this job done for you. So Jefferson uh, didn't want to tell this to the people. He wanted Congress to secretly appropriate, which can really only be accurately described as a slush fund of money to basically be used to pay off French politicians to then uh, sell uh, West Florida. And this was something that had just revolted John Randolph. He's saying, okay, now we're engaged in secret deals. Uh, this is all, you know, the, the sordid bribery. And what is this going to do to our relationship with Great Britain if they find out that we're secretly bribing France? Like, won't this actually increase foreign tensions because now Britain's going to be upset? They could potentially turn on us, et cetera. And this was just seen as a whole, a, a, a minefield. And though, though Congress passed what was known as the $2 million Act, basically never got implemented uh, because Randolph was scheming to delay appropriations and then uh, problems with Great Britain, et cetera, had caused um, uh, more and more, uh, you know, controversy over this. But it was very important. This <laughs> we, we did the, the whole history of Florida and acquiring Florida is like a great example of cronyism. And so West Florida was the main prize. Jefferson wanted to bribe France to coerce Spain into doing it. Randolph wasn't going to have any of it. Okay. Yeah, and then this, you know, this this skirmish, the scenario here, you know, it's it's really you know through for the next you know over a decade, or I guess around a decade, right? Of of, of just kind of tensions between Florida, yeah, you know, Spanish Florida and American interest, uh, uh, you know, the, the provoking. Uh, uh, you know, discontent amongst the population, having people operate on, on taking over territory here and there. Uh, and Andrew Jackson later on becomes a, a big figure and in, in, in using his sort of military wits to to, to invade uh, uh, the area and, and around Pensacola. Or uh, uh, where, where, does, where does Jackson invade? Uh, well, so where, where does Jackson, he invaded twice. <laughs> yeah. So first you had this, this little movement. It was around 1810 regarding this little, this, uh, gorillas took the land. So the, the part of the panhandle, this is a little bit, this is the, the part of the panhandle that was closest to new Orleans. Again, remember it went all the way to new Orleans. You originally had some gorillas. They went in there, they took it over. They wanted to become an independent state. And then Madison said, no, you're going to be uh, included into Louisiana. And yeah, you can't say anything about it. Tough. And then you had Jackson during the War of 1812. He invaded the panhandle, what's sort of now seen as the modern panhandle, a little bit closer, acquiring that land. Uh, this is the land that became the little coastal parts of Alabama and Mississippi. Okay. And then Jackson invaded it again uh, after the War of 1812 during the um, uh, during the, the Seminole War, and he had he had invaded, and this was seen as a big pretext for the United States to bully Spain into selling Florida. So there was many conquests of Florida. It was really just like a repeated attempt of the United States slowly just biting away Florida, and like poor Spain and the residents of Florida, they're 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 they're, they're dealing with this. But it's 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 fascinating because Florida is just super important for the the south and the united states at this time i mean it's seen as the it, it's this big uh protector of the gulf and whoever owns florida can really sort of monopolize uh the caribbean trade uh within this there, there is also a, a perception of madison's role in this as well that you know, some of the, the compromises from the old republicans you have a great quote uh, uh, I consider this 
matter as fairly at issue whether this nation is to be governed by a secret Machiavellian, invisible, irresponsible cabinet or the principles of the Constitution. Uh, you know, is, is Madison really sort of a, a in much the same way as, as perhaps Hamilton, sort of this this Machiavellian figure, uh, uh, really kind of wielding true political power, you know, pushing all the right buttons with Jefferson, manipulating the political landscape here, you know, the the the, the different debates over again trying to get regional factions involved and, and some of that aspect that that comes to dominate you know American politics going up the Civil War these these sectional disputes. You know, what is Madison's role through this period and in, in kind of setting up, you know, this this sort of of corruption of the Republican Party? Uh, en- enormously important because he's really the the head of the so-called moderates. So these are the ex-federalists that joined the Republican Party because they were sort of disturbed at the, the Federalists for going too far or for not bringing them in on their racket. So they didn't really want to get rid of the Federalist cronyism, maybe downsize it a little bit or just put themselves in charge of it. And so Madison was made Secretary of State by Jefferson and Secretary of State uh, was seen as a very important stepping stone of the presidency. And it really was an important stepping stone for the early 1800s. It's, it's something that's not understood now. And so Madison was a, a, a very big sort of corrupting agent in Jefferson's ear. You know, he thought the Louisiana Purchase was, uh, was constitutional. He was okay with bailing out the Yazoo land speculators. He was in favor of internal improvements. He wanted to uh, take over over Florida, and he made many steps to do so in his own presidential administration after Jefferson, uh, you know, from 1809 to 1817. And he was very important in corrupting uh, Jefferson. And this is why Randolph was always sort of seething at him. He was you know, accusing him of being sort of this Federalist kind of whispering in Jefferson's ear. So when I when I heard, when I read, I read books of, of Randolph describing this, I kind of think of, now I think of Madison as sort of like this Grima worm tongue from Lord of the Rings. And you have Jefferson, he's like this aging Theoden. And, uh, you know, he's, 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 uh, uh, Madison sort of telling him that, oh yeah, you can do all this stuff. Uh, you know, as long as, as long, it's, it's all just, you give it a good constitutional, uh, descript, you know, the, the justification and all of that. So Madison's very important. This is why I'm, 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 I'm negative on him. Uh, in many ways, I'm sort of more critical of him than Hamilton, though. I think Hamilton was much worse. I, I definitely don't pull my punches when it comes to Madison because sometimes it's the moderators that are just as bad as, as, as the, as the, is the big status, because they're the ones who are causing the, the, the reform coalition to falter. And so this is sort of Madison's legacy. I, I don't think he had a positive impact. I mean, there were good things he did. I'm not being like super, I don't, I don't want to be like super harsh on him, but ultimately, at least in, in, in the modern, uh, United States, uh, you know, after the, um, you know, during the 1790s and the 1800s, the 1810s, he really just kind of comes across as, as, uh, as, as a rhino, really, a Republican in name only, right? Which is, uh, you know, something that of course is used in, in earlier, you know, early 2000s, but it has just as much relevance uh, to the Republican Party of the Jeffersonian era. Well, it seems like in many ways, I mean, you could argue that Madison was far more effective at growing government than Alexander Hamilton because he kind of had that cloak. Right. And, and particularly the impact. I mean, the Federalists get thrown out of power after the 1800s, but it's the Virginian dynasty that comes into play from there on out. You know, they, they dominate the White House for a very long time. And, and it's, it's, it's sort of Madison that, that ends up kind of setting the stage for this, this decay of the Republican Party. Um, I, just, I, get, I, I think that's one of the best aspects of this book from just a narrative standpoint that, you know, because there, there is a lot of sympathy to Madison's ideas within, you know, libertarian circles. And I think that you do a great job of kind of you know, taking off the, the mask there of a Madison the Libertarian. Um, you know, let, let's go ahead and end on one last point. Uh, again, yet, yet another example of Republican decay. Um, you know, they, they embrace, uh, uh, you know, protection of domestic merchants, manufacturers, um, and, and kind of setting the stage not only for uh, the embargo that even, you know, high school textbooks will tell you was a bad idea, but really, a, a, just a kind of a bellicose sort of stand here with Great Britain generally, again, 
keep going back to that, that issue of land and expansion. I mean, it, it was the explicit goal of the Jeffersonians at by this point to go after Canada, to go after South America, right? You know, the idea of, you know, this, this, this broad growing empire of power, you know, it is really much at play here. And it ends up with heightening tensions between the U.S. and the U.K. Uh, and, you know, you have, you know, and, and which leads to the disastrous policies of the embargo, um, which, you know, thankfully were kind of undermined by smuggling. But, you know, this, this is, you know, perhaps the, the most obvious black eye of the Jeffersonian administration, but you know, just kind of hitting some of the unique aspects of this kind of, you know, to me, it just this simply highlights kind of, kind of the complete capitulation of the Jeffersonian Republican Party to, you know, the, 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 the saber rattling of the Hamiltonians. Oh, absolutely. And this is why I think the first Jefferson administration uh, was was great, with the exception of the Louisiana Purchase, which came, which came at the end. But the second administration is just a disaster. So by the time Jefferson leaves office in, in March of 1809, uh, his, his Republican Party has, has changed tremendously from just 10 years ago when they were fighting the Federalists. So one of the things Jefferson was also doing in his second administration was making moves to please manufacturers manufacturers and uh, shippers because they were concentrated in New England and he wanted to win that constituency, bring them um, into the Republican Party. This is always Jefferson's goal. Keep the empire growing, bring more people in to the Republican Party to ensure Republican Party dominance. OK, and th 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 some of the, the, the laws Jefferson uh, uh, you know, pushed for the Embargo Act was something very extreme that most shippers in uh, shippers didn't support, though manufacturers did support. But it's important to note that you know, Jefferson's justification for doing all this was kind of a lie because he always said, we're going to engage in an embargo with Great Britain um, because we want to show them that they can't impress our sailors uh, and that we're going to use this as a means to prevent war. Or at the same time, Jefferson's also building up the military and he's preparing for a secret invasion of Canada in the winter of, uh, of 08 and early 09 that basically gets stopped uh, at the last moment. Because what Jefferson really wanted was he wanted Canada and he also wanted Florida. OK, and this is the, the issue of the corrupting nature of land. Once you have Louisiana and you have the New Orleans, well, now you have to have Florida because how is New Orleans going to be protected if you don't have Florida? How are you going to be able to use the control the Gulf trade if you don't have Florida? And then when you have Louisiana all the way to the west, you also want to get Canada. You want to bring Canada into the uh, into the country. And that way you can, can totally uh, monopolize the uh, trade of the Great Lakes region. OK, and this is just continually the problem of of territorial expansion always leads to more territorial expansion. All right. So these these various laws, such as Jefferson's Embargo Act, which I, I often teach it to my students, is sort of our, our nation's first lockdown kind of right where we say we're not going to import or export goods on American ships was completely completely disastrous, right? It led to enormous amounts of unemployment in idled ships, um, you know, just uh, sailors and, and, and ships and hurt industry to hurt farmers because they couldn't sell their goods. It led to smuggling. Jefferson was using uh, U.S. soldiers to prevent people from peacefully trading with Canadians. I mean, just like a total disaster, right? When you're like, Jefferson, what are you, what are you thinking of? And, and poor Albert Gallatin, who was against this embargo, was basically saddled with enforcing it. And the treasury bureaucracy blows up with all the edicts and rules and regulations of all this stuff. And it's, it really just shows you the, the evolution of the Republican Party uh, went from the reform group fighting the Federalists. So this liberty fighting power, right, to then liberty moderating and only moderately decreasing cronyism, to then liberty getting corrupted by power, to then supporting its own cronyism, which is which basically culminates into a war of conquest, uh, the War of 1812. Well, I think that is a good part for us to leave off on, kind of setting the stage for President Madison coming up soon. Um, if you have not yet got your copy of Cronyism, Liberty versus Power in America, 1607-1849, we have a discount for you using uh, coupon code LVP. 
We have a discount for both the paperback and hardback versions of the book. If you've been enjoying this podcast, you got to get the book. Uh, I believe there's also an audio book in the works that'll be coming here shortly. Um, but Let, let's just also note that inflation is at 7%, right? And the Mises Institute were lowering prices on goods. So it's, yeah, this is know. our way of fighting inflation. Right? Absolutely. And, and cronyism and all, all its sorts. <laughs> So again, if, if you are enjoying this podcast, again, we've gotten some great responses. I want to thank you all for that. Please rate, review, subscribe, you know, do all, all that sort of stuff you're supposed to do with podcasts. Um, again, we got, we got a lot of great episodes down the pipeline. Um, with that being said, for Patrick Newman, this is Tho Bishop. Thank you for listening to Liberty Versus Power. Oh, geez. Oh, oh. Tommy, Tommy, what are you what are you saying? <laughs>